The San Lucia Highlands happens to have kind of the perfect climate, the perfect soils, the perfect everything to make really beautiful Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Just a beautiful 18 miles long, couple miles wide section on the western side of the Sierra de Salinas in the Salinas Valley. How about just paint a picture for me, obviously with Jay Lohr. What is the SLH play for Jay Lohr? The Costa Vineyard is planted to about two thirds Chardonnay, one third Pinot Noir, about 100 acres total. Our Highlands Bench is a slightly more expensive wine. We also use some of the Chardonnay for our famous Riverstone program, and some of the Pinot Noir goes into our estate's bottling of the Falcons for Pinot. What are some of the characteristics that you love most about SLH wines? I think that the SLH wines have a pretty distinctive profile. Welcome to the Share the Lord podcast by J. Lord Vineyards and Wines, where we take you behind the scenes over a glass of wine. Let's uncork and dive in. So today we are diving into everything San Lucia Highlands. I'm sitting down with a very special gu- uh, guest who is Gwen McGill, who is the executive director of the San Lucia Highlands. And then actually, uh, also we have a former executive director with Dave Murray here and who is now our senior marketing director. And of course, my name is Josh Baldovino. I'm the marketing manager here at JLore. And we are diving into all things SLH. So Gwen, thanks for jumping on the show. Thanks for having me. Can't wait to talk about everything Santa Lucia Highlands. You are the executive director of the Santa Lucia Highlands. So first off, who is Gwen and what's so special about the SLH? Oh, boy. Um, I started working with the Santa Lucia Highlands group in 2017. Um, Prior to that, I had been working on my own as an independent contractor kind of in the marketing, public relations, and events space in the wine business. And before then, um, was running marketing and public relations for a couple of wine companies as well, um, both larger and smaller. So have some experience with the wholesale side, the PR side, events of all kinds, trade and consumer, and um, got this wonderful opportunity when when Dave here decided he was uh, going to take an exit Um, from the SLH, the Wine Artisans Group, and so I started in 2017. So the San Lucia Highlands, I want to take a little step back to historically kind of the Monterey region, just to put it in a little bit of a context. For one thing, a lot of people don't even know where the San Lucia Highlands is, so let's talk Monterey County, right? Monterey and the San Lucia Highlands is about two hours south of San Francisco, what, maybe a little over an hour south of San Jose, um, you know, many hours, what do you think, four, six hours north of, of Los Angeles, kind of five hours to Santa Barbara. Um, we're really basically south of the Monterey Bay in what they call the Salinas Valley, which is many people know it as the salad bowl of the nation. This is an, a really important ag center for California and for the United States, as a matter of fact. But kind of going back, Monterey at one point, the city of Monterey was founded in like 1770. And at that point, it was really known as the capital of what was called Alta California. So this was back when um, the Spanish were colonizing. This was back when the missionaries were, the missions were being established. And then through the period of the Mexican-American War as well, Monterey was really sort of not only the political, but also like the religious capital of California. So Mm -hmm. at the time, Monterey really had a lot more significance than it maybe does today. After that, there were a couple of big things that happened back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then kind of through the 1940s, there were a lot of people coming to the United States. There were people coming from all over, as we know, moving through Ellis Island, um, immigrating to America. And at the time, the Salinas Valley somehow became a destination for groups that came through Ellis Island, um, many of whom there were, I don't know, 50,000 or some Swiss Italian uh, immigrants that came through Ellis Island and were directed to the Salinas Valley, mainly because they had dairy farming and some agricultural background. And so this has really become an important part of kind of the culture of the Salinas Valley, which has also become an important part of the agricultural community, right? So just a beautiful 18 miles long, couple miles wide section on the western side of the Sierra de Salinas Mm -hmm. um, in the Salinas Valley. That's where we are. Okay. And so today's kind of fun because I have uh, two rock stars, right? I have the current executive director and I have Dave Murray, who's our current J-Lore senior marketing director, but you obviously, but you also previously held uh, her seat before. So how about just paint the picture for me, obviously with J-Lore. 
What is the SLH play for Jalor? So the San Lucia Highlands, uh, as Gwen was describing it, this wonderful little district up on the mountainside, literally above the Salinas Valley, is almost contiguous, actually it is contiguous in certain points to uh, the Oroseco AVA, where Jay Lohr's main vineyards are based, uh, where Jerry Lohr helped pioneer, uh, goodness, 50 years ago now. And so there's always been a natural affinity with the SLH, the Santa Lucia Highlands, and uh, Jay Lohr. Early 2000s, uh, Jay Lohr partnered with the Costa family, uh, a longtime ranching family in the Santa Lucia Highlands, one of the families that Gwen was describing that uh, cattle ranching and farming up there, and they were looking to turn one of their ranches in, right in the middle of the highlands into a vineyard property like so many of their neighbors had done over the previous, you know, 10 and 20 years. Uh, so we partnered, J. Lohr partnered with the Costa family. Uh, J. Lohr handled all the layout, the design of the vineyards, uh, all the different plotting for water and for soils, uh, and that was the start of the Costa vineyard uh, from which we draw some of our fruit, including the Highlands Bench Pinot that we're tasting today. And when was that vineyard planted? Remind me. I think it's, uh, two, I want to say 2007, 2008. Okay. Um, so first vintage off of it would have been probably about uh, 2010. Um, it's planted, uh, the Costa Vineyard is planted uh, to about two-thirds Chardonnay, one-third Pinot Noir, about 100 acres total. Uh, and besides the Highland Bench Pinot Noir that we use exclusively the Pinot Noir fruit from there, uh, we also use some of the Chardonnay uh, for our, our famous Riverstone program, uh, and some of the Pinot Noir goes into our estate's bottling of the Falcon's Perch Pinot. So it's a really cool, beautiful property, um, and one we have a long relationship with, and provides a really nice, uh, really great quality fruit for our main bottling here from the Vineyard Series, uh, and then also some of our larger distributed wines as well. Okay. That ties it. Now, I want to get into, obviously, for the consumers who are either watching this on YouTube or listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, I guess you better get onto YouTube so you actually see what we're doing here. But, Gwen, my question is, we have a little bit of wine in a glass, and we're talking about terroir and weather and soil and climate. So what are some of the characteristics that you love most about SLH wines? I think that the SLH wines have a pretty distinctive profile and a real and, and true and interesting story behind it because of soils, climate, all these different pieces that make this wine region unique, which is really why we have AVAs, right? American viticulture areas like the Santa Lucia Highlands, like the Sonoma Coast, like Napa Valley. It's to identify a region and basically help us understand why wines from this region have something that, that might be typical of this region. The Santa Lucia Highlands happens to have kind of the perfect climate, the perfect soils, the perfect everything to make really beautiful Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And I think one of the things that consumers love so much about these wines from the Santa Lucia Highlands is they're very friendly. They are bright. They're vibrant. They have a real freshness to them. But they're also silky and luxurious and, you know, really smooth and so you have this beautiful combination of kind of this mouth-watering freshness and vibrancy of the wines, but smooth flavors, a very nice, rich mouthfeel. And, you know, you can see there's a lot of color in this wine. And all of these things are really because of the special place and the kind of unique attributes to the climate and the soil and the topography of the region. Anything else you want to add to your kind of favorite notes about SLH? No, it's just fun uh, trying the wines now as a, as a fan and a collector rather than having to worry about publicizing them and, <laughs> and writing about them like Gwen does. Yeah, I agree completely with Gwen. The, the Pinot Noirs over the last 25 years, 30 years uh, out of the San Jose Highlands are the equal of any in the New World. And they've made a reputation for the district um, that Gwen does a great job of telling the story of. Uh, and quite a few of them are in my cellar uh, from the different producers that I used to work with there. So love the Pinots from there. I should mention the best red wine I've ever had from the Highlands, though, was not a Pinot Noir. It was a Syrah. Hmm. Uh, they grow quite a bit of Syrah in the Highlands as well. And uh, a 2001 Wedding Hill Paraiso Syrah, which full disclosure is a brand I used to consult and work for, most incredible Syrah I've ever had, a dead ringer for a top flight Hermitage from Northern Rhone. And I drank the last bottle that I had in my collection about two years ago, and it was 
stunning. One of the best red wines I've ever had in my life. So Pinot is, is number one in the Highlands, of course, but they do a great job with Syrah as well. Agree. Agree, yeah. definitely. What are some other maybe little-known or lesser-known facts about the SLH? Well, I would say that the proximity to the ag industry is very unique among wine regions, right? So you think about wine and you think, oh, it's vineyards, it's agriculture. It is for sure. But if you go to Napa or maybe less so Sonoma, you don't see the same kind of agriculture proximity and influence that you do in the Santa Lucia Highlands. When you are standing in the Highlands, you look east, you see the Gabalon Range, the Pinnacles National Monument and the other side, but all across the valley floor, is row crops. So cabbage, lettuce, broccoli, strawberries, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, um, all kinds of funky little unique plots too, doing things like um, it's a little hybrid cauliflower, broccoli, callalini. There's all kinds of things happening in, in the Salinas Valley. And so that's something that's very unique. There just aren't other wine regions that have that kind of feel to them. And it really informs the farming, right? You have a lot of these farmers that are growing grapes now. They used to be row crop farmers. Many of these Swiss Italian families that we mentioned, the Pisonis, the Carciolis, the Violinis, um, the Franchonis. So many of these families come from an ag history, and so that's really unique and different. I think really most defining and important thing about the Santa Lucia Highlands that's really unique is its proximity to the Monterey Bay and how that affects the climate. So the Monterey Bay is this huge body of water. I mean, people don't quite realize how big it is because it's also extremely deep. So they call it the, you know, underwater Grand Canyon, right? This this big, huge, deep body of water. And what's significant about that is that it's very cold. It's so much water, it stays cold. So you have this really, really moderating factor happening in the Monterey Bay. The Salinas Valley is, you know, maybe 13 miles south of that. But every day what happens in the Salinas Valley is this very long and pretty much narrow tunnel that goes all the way down to Paso Robles. A lot of people know Paso for its big reds, its Cabernet, its um, Zinfandel. Um, it's much, much warmer down in Paso Robles. So as you go down Monterey County, um, the Salinas Valley is kind of in the middle. Then you get further south. It gets warmer as you go further away from the Monterey Bay. But what, this ha what happens here is as these regions in the south heat up, they create this vacuum effect and start pulling this cool air that's coming off of the Monterey Bay, pulls it down valley. And what that creates is a very intense wind. And this wind is important because it moderates temperature, it creates airflow, and it basically changes the way the grapes actually ripen in the region. So the wind has, as I mentioned, this cooling effect. So it cools down. The temperatures in Santa Lucia Highlands, their hottest point in the middle of the day may be 1 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. If you're up in Napa or Sonoma, it's 4 o'clock, it's 5 o'clock, it's still warm. After that, the breeze from the um, either you know from the ocean or from the San Francisco Bay will start kind of flowing in and cool things down. But in Monterey County, this is 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, somewhere around there. And what that does is it actually stops ripening in the grapevines themselves. So photosynthesis, photosynthesis say that fast a few times, <laughs> photosynthesis will stop because the wind starts coming in. It can be so fierce, it's 10 to 25 miles an hour. Photosynthesis will stop, right? That What th that means is the vine are not ripening anymore. They're, there's no fruit ripening. They just kind of shut down. They're like, we're going to chill out because this wind is kind of causing us a little bit of stress. So that makes ripening happen in the SLH very, very slowly over a very long period of time. So you've got the wind. Mm -hmm. You've also got this beautiful fog that happens at night. And so almost every night you can see late or, you know, kind of early evening to late in the night, you'll start to see this fog bank marching down from the Monterey Bay through the Santa Lucia Highlands. It probably reaches up to 1,000, 1,200 feet in the region. So it's covering a lot of the vineyards, keeping them, keeping them cool, you know, providing a little bit of moisture. It's not a region that gets very much rain. I mean, 10 to 14 inches of rain is very little rain. I mean, in Napa, you're talking 40 and 40 inches and Sonoma Coast, you're talking 
50 to 60 even sometimes. So it provides this beautiful kind of fog effect that cools everything down. Um, and that is perfect for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and, and Syrah too, that like cool areas, right? So really that wind, that proximity to the Monterey Bay, um, the low rainfall, this causes the long growing season. And what the long growing season does is gives you a lot more time to ripen. So you get these phenolics and all that beautiful flavor and aroma that's happening in the grapes happens because we have this long, even ripening. But then we have this cooling wind that keeps it cool. So it's a really true cool climate region. Um, the temperature is so drastically different than if you're standing in Sonoma Coast even and feeling this, okay, this is supposed to be coastal. It feels much different in the Santa Lucia Highlands. So it's, it's really a cooler region. But what happens basically is that the wind comes, cools down the vineyards, creates this long hake time. So you get the grape skins, mm -hmm. they get very ripe, they can develop all this aromatics, but the cool climate keeps that freshness and that acidity, right, that's underlying that gives you that flavor. So all those things are what makes up this beautiful flavor that is so different from Pinot Noir from other regions because of that wind, because of that fog, and because of the proximity of the Monterey Bay, basically. Okay, so you're painting a beautiful picture of what San Jose Highlands look like. And obviously now, just, I'm going to educate, I know that some of the viewers are, may already be familiar and may already be SLH lovers, for the novice wine consumers who may not know and now want to explore, right, the easiest way to find on most, or actually on all the wine labels, you'll have a location. Dave, can you explain kind of what the difference is and what they should be looking for on a label? In terms of its sense of place and its yeah. location? Right, so um, as Gwen was talking about the, um, the AVA system uh, in California and the United States, uh, basically delineate smaller and smaller portions that give you more information on the label. In this case, it's uh, Monterey is the overall general ABA, and then Santa Lucia Highlands is the spe specific sub-ABA of Monterey, right? And so that information, that smaller and smaller definition of place or sense mm -hmm. of place gives the uh, wine consumer, in this case, our Highlands Bench is a, you know, a slightly more expensive wine, gives the high-end collector and wine consumer just that much more information on how to place the wine in its setting and all the wonderful attributes of the Highlands that Gwen is talking about. You taste those in the bottle, and so we're proud to put that right on the label. So the AVA appell appellated system on each bottle like that gives you, the consumer, a whole bunch of extra info. Yeah, and so if you are looking to try either, of course, Archie Lower Highlands Bench, Pinot Noir, or any of the other SLH wines, you can look for that on the label. Uh, as we're talking about consumers, obviously you're sitting here with the marketing team, and I know a large part of your job, too, is also marketing the region. I just want to talk about like fun projects that you have done, expanding the, the knowledge and love of the region. Is there something memorable in the last seven years that you've done that really stands out to you? I definitely. You know, we were really fortunate to um, have applied for and received a large uh, grant funding from mm -hmm. the California Department of Food and Ag. This actually comes from the USA, USDA um, Farm Bill. So a portion of that farm bill is allocated to promote specialty crops. And in California, we have lots and lots of specialty crops. It could be almonds. For us, of course, it's wine grapes. And we applied for this grant and received a $300,000 marketing grant to um, promote the Santa Lucia Highlands region over the span of a couple of years. Um, we targeted a few specific markets where a lot of our members have distribution. We have good trade, um, wholesale restaurant retail accounts, um, good wine club accounts. There were also direct flight markets from Monterey. So trying to raise the awareness of the region in these markets, as well as connect with the trade, who we bring out for an event we call the Psalm Summit, or start, excuse me, the Psalm Tour, a slight Psalm Tour. Um, we connected with consumers in the events through a sampling tasting event that was paired with food um, at some great restaurants and all these different markets. And it gave us over $100,000 of marketing dollars to really leverage um, the stories about our region, the stories about the individual vineyards, the individual winemakers, 
and use all kinds of excellent digital tools um, from, you know, advertising on Facebook and Instagram, advertising these events, but also really telling the stories of the Santa Lucia Highlands um, with these digital marketing dollars. And so um, that brought a lot of attention on the media side, as well as a lot of impressions digitally about the Santa Lucia Highlands. And, you know, these things are so important because as an organization, my job, Dave was, you know, essentially the first executive director of the Santa Lucia Highlands Wine Artisans, which is the Vintners and Growers Group. So we have um, an assessment style um, format for raising money, which is the members, um, both associate members that make wine from these regions but don't own any vineyards, they pay an annual fee, while our growers pay a dues assessment. They pay a by acreage fee. Um, and a membership fee to be a part of the organization and reap the benefits of our mission, which is really promotion and raising awareness and marketing the region, right? So doing this kind of work on our own, there are really only so many avenues for fundraising and the opportunity to get a grant like that of $300,000, that's the equivalent to our budget for one year, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that it's it was really a big thing and it was, um, it was wonderful to make sure we had an opportunity to really engage our membership um, who just had so much fun. We we kind of called it this mighty cool Pinot tour and we went to Phoenix and Denver and San Diego and Los Angeles and promoted the beautiful Pinot Noirs. Really talked a lot about the single vineyard aspect of the Santa Lucia Highlands too, where you've got um, quite a number of vineyards that have good notoriety because we have so many people making wines from these vineyards. Um, so, you know, really being able to kind of tell the story and show people, yeah, we're a tiny region in Monterey County, but hey, look at all these wineries from Napa and from Sonoma that source their Pinot Noir from these specific vineyards, whether it's Gary's Vineyard or Rosella's Vineyard or Sierra Mar Vineyard or Pisoni Vineyard or Escol Road Vineyard. All these vineyards are really developing this cachet. And so being able to go out and promote that and get all, all of our members together, that was, I think, probably our biggest um, opportunity with that that wonderful grant to really do some more marketing that we had never been able to do before. Totally. I mean, everyone loves a great tour, especially for the trade, to really get and dive deep into a region. Mm-hmm. I want to flip it now on the consumer side. If obviously the easiest way for someone to explore the region would be to go find a bottle or a couple and just try them. Right. But now say someone wants to visit. Dave, I'm going to throw it to you first and then I'm going to throw it back to you. If you had to pick out like a perfect day in the SLH as a consumer, what would start? That's a really good question. So when I was working for the group, um, there were very few tasting rooms in the Salinas Valley and in the Santa Lucia Highlands in general. Um, but the ones that were there, for instance, uh, the old Paraiso tasting room or especially Hahn up on the hill there, because of their elevated location on the, on the bench in the Sierra de Salinas, just amazing views. Like you can see all the way over to the pinnacles, as Gwen mentioned, incredible. So I would normally, what I used to do is I would just settle in at one because they were kind of far apart. You couldn't hit up, it's not like wine Disneyland in Napa where you can hit you know, three or four in a day if if you can manage it or could afford it. Uh, In the Highlands, uh, they're fairly spread out, few in number. Uh, So I would settle into one for the day with my picnic lunch and just sit there and enjoy the incredible views and then really explore a deep dive into that particular labels, labels wines. Is it still that way, Gwen? Not not too many tasting rooms? Yeah, I think that's good advice. One of the other unique things is that this is an area that is in you know, not a highly populated area, not that maybe Napa Valley is either, but its proximity is just slightly different. There's also not the infrastructure of hospitality and tourism right around the the Salinas Valley and where the Santa Lucia Highlands is located. So it's a bit of a trek. You do need to kind of plan ahead to get there. There are a number of different tours and um, a couple of a couple of people. There's Sammy with Monterey Guided Wine Tours. There's Dina Franchoni with a, a wine tour as well. And they will help drive you down. They will help you set up um, tastings. There are a couple of really great uh, tasting rooms in the region. So um, Rustique Wines, they have a beautiful old barn. They're just outside the edges of the AVA, but they make SLH wines. Then you get to Odonata as you're heading south. Puma Road, you'll hit Pisano. 
Um, crew is down at the very end of the AVA. Wrath is there. So there's a lot to choose from, and each of them have kind of different offerings. Some of them have more Pinot Noir. Some of them have um, some other different unique varietals, like Odonata is making really fun, you know, a, a sparkling Riesling and a Syrah and some other fun things. But it's it takes a minute to get down there. So I think Dave's right. You pick one, maybe two. The other way that you can really explore the wines of the Santa Lucia Highlands is by going to Carmel. So you know, exploring the coast there, the beautiful Monterey coast is really special. You know, you've got Pebble Beach, you've got 17 mile drive, um, some very cute little Carmel Valley Village, Carmel Village, Carmel Valley Sea, just so many, so many really neat things to explore there. There's also a lot of tasting rooms there. And so there is the Carmel Wine Walk that goes through Carmel by the Sea. There are, I don't know, 15 different tasting rooms there. And most of them have some Santa Lucia Highlands wine. So that's another easy way to visit and um, not have to drive maybe down to the AVA, still get a feel for it and explore more wines at once. And plus, you once a year throw one of the coolest wine tastings in California, where People can come one day in the Highlands, right, and yeah. taste all of these wines that normally are not available to the public. Yeah. Right? Thank you for bringing that up. So the Sun, Wind, and Wine Festival we do every May at Marisolet Vineyards. Marisolet is not open to the public. It is a stunning property. They take their big barrel room. They clear out the barrels. We have you know, sometimes 40 different wineries in there pouring and usually about 20 producers, um, restaurants, food purveyors from up in the peninsula and even down as far as King City that come and kind of bring all these delicious bites for our, our customers. Um, we probably have 900 people there when we put all of the vintners, all of the chefs and restaurateurs and consumers together. And it's really a favorite because it's the one time a year where most of these producers get together. And it is the producers themselves. It is the grower behind the table. It's the winemaker behind the table. It is such a community. It has a real special feel to it. Um, every year the food is delicious. Every year people rave about the wines. It, it's just a really consistently fantastic event. So definitely that's that's probably one of the best ways to experience the Santa Lucia Highlands. I do hear a lot of great things. I have our team has been there and I actually another team member goes every single year, but I have yet to go there myself. So we'll get you there next time. I mean and that's the <laughs> list. Okay, let's uh change gears a little bit. I want to get to know you a little bit, Gwen. Okay. Let's start with the first question here, just some extras of what's your favorite wine rule to break? The real rule breaker is that there are no rules. I really find that the challenge the wine industry faces is this idea of rules and this idea that there's some script you have to follow or some protocol or, you know, etiquette that is involved around wine. And the reality is it's just off-putting, right? It just makes people feel uncomfortable. It makes them feel like they don't know enough to indulge in a glass of wine or pick out a bottle of wine. I will be found, you know, a couple times a month deciding I want some Chardonnay and there's no Chardonnay in the fridge. What do I do? I put ice in it, you know, oops, <laughs> right? So, or, or the idea that like you have to pair a red wine with red meat, you know, those things are just over. They are over, right? You can enjoy whatever you like. The key is to find what you like. I would say break the rules. Okay. I, I like that too. I like to... Test the rules. How about you, Dave? Do you have a favorite rule that you like to break? It's exactly along the lines of what Gwen just said. I, 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 I have white wine with with steak, and I have red wine with fish. For me, it's I pick the wine I want, and I pick the dish I want. And if the wine is good enough, it will go, it will find a way to go with that dish. So yeah, same kind of rule breaking. And when you do that in a restaurant, though, sometimes you get the eyebrow raised <laughs> from the psalm or from the wine steward. And I just, I always feel like I need to tell them, in the, I'm, it's okay, I'm in the wine industry. I know what I'm doing, but they always give you a little bit of a look when you go that way. Yeah, that's true. You do have to remind them, like, hey, it's my choice. Right. I'm going to do what I want. I know, right. what I'm, I know what I'm up to here. Yeah, as long as you like it. That's yeah, the end goal. Absolutely. Okay, what, how about, you talk about pairings. What's the most unbelievable, your favorite wine pairing that you've had of all time? Like, all time, anywhere. Okay, I would say one of the most memorable wine pairings I had was a little unusual for me to be saying this too. I'm not a sweet wine person. Um, I tend to not drink uh, sweet wines, but I was in Canada in um, 
at with Inniskillen, which is a brand that's very known for an ice wine that they make, which is, you know, bet- Botrytis. Um, it's Chardonnay, basically, that's been left on the vines. It gets very high in sugar. And the way they make it is into this kind of rich and unctuous white wine. And I, you know, they gave us some pairing with, it was probably foie gras or something like that. And wow, that was just so beautiful. The acidity of this sweet wine that really cut through this very rich, delicious dish was really kind of something amazing. Um, But I have to say, you know, really, truly, one of my favorite things is Pinot Noir with something like paella, just this little bit of spice there, this kind of, you know, different but exciting dish. But then that Pinot Noir, it's got this beautiful savory richness and also this kind of verve and acidity behind it that kind of balances it out. That's that's another favorite. Uh, along the same lines, um, favorite pairing of all time. Well, the one where the scales just kind of fell off my eyes once was years ago uh, sitting at the bar in Jardinere uh, up in San Francisco, which uh, sadly is gone, but uh, Tracy Desjardins uh, flagship restaurant back in the day. And I will never forget sitting at that counter and having a glass of Burgundy, Pinot Noir, uh, with her famous um, roast duck and this bed of just like simple, freshly prepared lentils and just the simplicity of the plate and uh, just the straightforward nature, cherry and plum nature of of the Burgundy. It's like, oh, this is what wine pairing is all about. I get it now. This was quite a few years ago, so I still remember that meal. Mine was also kind of an unlock. Uh, Steve Peck says that I can't use the newbie in the wine industry anymore because I guess I'm four years <laughs> in. But I do remember the first year that I joined JLOR, which is my first wine job ever. Uh, I said, it's, uh, the food and wine pairings, and I was never a big wine drinker. And I, and I was like, is, is it really that that magical and I remember we we're you know at home this is in the middle of COVID and so we're trying all these different recipes and one of mine was there was an oyster recipe that I had with one of our Sauv Blancs and uh, our tasting manager was like hey okay, you dip, do the typical take the sip first and do the sip and bite and then see how that changes and then I could act, for the first time ever I could actually taste that a flavor profile change I said oh you should try it together and that was an unlock for me so that's kind of like the first one there. Um, but it's fun. Okay, the last question I have to the get to know Gwen, and then we'll close it out, is what is uh, what's the most memorable drink you've ever had? Who was it with, and what made it so memorable? Oh my gosh, I would say that maybe because we're kind of in a work experience uh, situation here. Um, early on in my work in the wine business, I was. Um, lucky enough to experience an event where I was with a whole group of Napa Valley vintners. And these were the icons, right? This is Robert Mondavi. This is some of the Mondavi family. This is a few others. And we were in the context of a project that was actually about chili, um, because many of these Napa Valley vintners, Augustin Huneus and some others, have um, wines in chili. And we were doing a wine dinner, and it was kind of focused around these these Chilean wines. But we were in Napa Valley, and the Mondavi crew, Tim Mondavi, Mr. Mondavi, were there. They brought out, you know, a I don't even remember the year, but it was from the 70s. And here I am, a girl from Nebraska that, you know, grew up not in wine, um, drinking a beautiful, a, old, historic bottle of wine from Robert Mondavi Winery with some of the icons of the industry. Just one of the greatest honors and privileges. Like I, I never expected that I would be able to have an experience like that, right, in the wine business. And uh, people are so gracious and generous that those things happen. And I, and I'm, I feel very lucky that that was uh, an experience I won't forget. That's a fun one. That's a fun one. Okay, so to wrap things up, obviously we spoke a lot about SLH and why it's so amazing. Gwen, give me the plug. If someone wants to explore SLH and enjoy it, how can they find out more? I would go to SantaLuciaHighlands.com. That is our website. You can find videos. You can sign up for harvest and growing season updates that we do on Zoom four times a year. 
you can find wineries. You can find our wines. It will give you a list of where all of the tasting rooms of all these wines that sell Santa Lucia Highlands wines are. You can find their tasting rooms. You can go visit them at, online. We've got these beautiful vineyard maps, a whole bunch of different vineyard maps that really can help you explore. Um, we are about to launch a topographic map that's super cool. But it's basically the hub of where you can learn all about the Santa Lucia Highlands and figure out where you can find the wines as well. Um, there's a journal that talks about the different varietals. Um, there's a lot more coming too. So um, I would say go there, sign up on the mailing list, and you can keep, keep up to date about our events and about everything happening. Beautiful. And then on the flip side, more specifically, Dave, for us and J. Lore, if someone wants to explore more about how SLH fits into the J. Lore portfolio, where's the best place that they should go? Uh, same kind of answer, jlore.com is our website, and it has information on the Lore's 50-year history in both the Royal Seco and uh, in the Santa Lucia Highlands more recently. So you can find all the information on our vineyards and the wines that come from those sensational properties at jlore.com. Perfect. And if you enjoyed this episode, wherever you are listening, watching it, please make sure to give it a like, a thumbs up, follow, subscribe, etc. And then we hope you enjoy a glass of SLH wine soon. Delicious. Highlands Cheers, Bench. guys. Cheers. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Glenn.